3D printing in the right hands can be an amazing tool. If you consider purchasing your first 3D printer, I believe you should also treat it as a tool rather than a purpose, because while most online 3D printing communities use it to compare their benches, functional 3D printing is usually only a part of a larger project. Such projects may involve additional materials, components and quite often electronics. It is mostly used for fast iterating prototypes, similar to SpaceX near launch site factories, or actual products that you adjust as you come up with new ideas and get feedback from clients. That's banging, right? Who are you, stranger? Jay. Hmm. All hail Jay! All hail Jay! All hail Jay! All hail Jay! All hail Jay. All hail oh, merciful Jay, the keeper of... Come on. A DIY ribbon microphone is a great example for such a project. You will find video time codes, related links, parts, additional info and updates on this project in the video description. As I was making this video, I kept finding new ideas and techniques to make it better. So I encourage you to watch this video thoroughly, think about the insights and ideas I'm sharing, take them, choose the ones that fit your needs, design, vision or budget and try improving upon them. I got interested in ribbon microphones a few years ago after I began recording my guitar with the industry industry standard Shura SM57 um, but I couldn't figure out why it doesn't sound like the records I like. Turned out I didn't know a lot about recording and mixing but also that many of my favorite tones used more than one microphone. The uh, SM57 Shure, this is a Sennheiser 421 and the Royer 121 ribbon. Uh, use the three uh, all together uh, on one speaker and just kind of make a good blend all together. Mm. So that's how it's done, kids, time. and it's just two guitars. So, you know, one one track, and then you just double another one, and that's when the magic happens. Because everything gets wide, and it just gets super forward. And just try it at home, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Like many others, my goal was to capture the amp in the room sound without drowning in reverb and delays like Steve Vai. Based on my personal research, many YouTube reviews, tutorials, articles and my own recording tests, I found that in many cases a ribbon microphone was involved. In most of them it was a Royer R121. The real one. The R121 model has been in production since the 90s. Today we have many budget options. The most popular alternative is probably Bayer Dynamics M160, along with many less known companies and a variety of DIY kits. It is important to say that if all you need is a ribbon microphone, just invest in one. Either save up or go and order one right now. Most chances you won't regret. If Royer is too expensive, go watch some reviews and find the one mic that sounds good to your ears across multiple examples. Examples. Ribbon mics often become the main guitar sound with a bit of SM57 sprinkled on top end to cut through the mix. But if you want something unique or maybe you'll want to make more such microphones in the future, potentially developing a product of your own as a side hustle, uh, it is relatively easy to make a ribbon microphone that works. Anyway, it is always useful to throw an extra mic when you record, to try different tones. If it sounds bad, great. Uh, many songs use heavily EQ'd or distorted instruments as intros or enhancing some parts of the song. The fun part about 3D printing is if you took the time to think and refine the design, planned the way you're going to implement it, did the research and used parametric modeling, the only thing you're left to do is to print the parts and assemble the mic. For example, this project took me about 4 years to finish, testing the limits of my 3D printer, my modeling skills and my patience. After hearing and watching Ulf from Hoborek channel making his ribbon microphone, I ordered the parts he used, magnets from K&J Magnetics, aluminum foil and Lundell transformer. Or Lundell. Back then I was occupied with my university finals, so I neither had the time to work on it or a plan for the microphone body. But I did take that time period and watched all the DIY ribbon mic videos I could find on YouTube. All of them seemed very complicated to implement, so the main objective I set for this project was to make it as easy as possible to reproduce in the future, either by getting the right parts in the first place or minimizing the production effort. Eventually one of the courses I took at the university led me to buying a 3D printer with this project in mind. At some point I figured that I should try and print the whole uh, microphone rather than just the transducer, aka the ribbon motor. Most of the work on this project was about simplifying the design and production steps for making it work on a 3D printer. 
It was mostly about planning and coming up with ideas while walking home from work. One decision led to another, after many walks, many mistakes, prototypes and happy accidents, I finally got a working prototype. So let's take it apart to see what I did back then. Anyway, I'm gonna need the transformer inside it to compare to the DIY transformers I made as well. So this is the first working prototype. The microphone is basically a Royer R121, but the dimensions are different from an actual Royer. They were all optimized either for the parts I could buy or the 3D printing limitations. I should have mentioned that I have the most basic and popular uh, FDM single nozzle printer, a stock Ender 3 Pro. Since I never touched the Royer, I managed to find some technical details about its structure in the blueprints shown in some videos, a manufacturing process documentary how it's made or how stuff's made, uh, on Discovery Channel, a bit of Googling and forums. By the way, their famous offset ribbon patent has expired in 2019 and Leon Todd has a video stating that the Royer design is probably based on a 1950s Bang & Olufsen microphone, a really gorgeous piece of retro art deco design. You can Google the history of both, it's quite fascinating to read how ribbon microphones were almost ditched as condenser and dynamic microphones took over and how they came back. It reminds me how tape and cassette and VHS simulation plugins brought us the whole lo-fi genre. Anyway, if I remember correctly, in my model the tube is a bit thicker, the grills are a bit wider, the grill slots or grooves aren't as deep as Royer's because these areas are all uh, potentially weak points for FDM printers and how well the layers are held together. To be able to print the grills, which are basically overhangs in 3D printing terms, I added small ribbons in between to support them. These ribbons um, help printing the microphone increase in uh, strength and can act as a built-in pop filter if we increase their number. I really wish I had a dual extruder printer for printing uh, dissolvable PVA supports because the need to manually remove supports is probably the worst limitation of FDM printers, at least in my opinion. You can try removing them but I decided to keep them and made them part of the model. Uh, I think two is enough and it looks pretty stylish. This threaded XLR connector has in fact inspired me to go with the R121 body shape. At first I wanted to order regular XLR inserts, but the shipping methods to Israel from US stores are insanely expensive. Later I came across this wonderful Neutrik NC3 MPR HD connector, but again expensive shipping. After several months of searching for an alternative, I figured maybe such small and cheap parts are sold only in bulk, and indeed, I found both the connector and the inserts. I assume it is in fact the original manufacturer of the Neutrik connectors because they look super high quality. I think another great use for this connector is for internal drum miking systems. Using this connector you drill a single hole in each tom and you're done. It looks awesome and you can easily spray paint the ring if you want. This connector comes with a nut, but I made a mistake during prototyping and set the tube thickness inside rather than outside. So the first ribbon motor prototype didn't fit, but I solved a, an issue of how to use this connector. Simply screw it in as is. Works like a charm, no screws required. We'll talk about shielding and grounding a bit later. Alternatively, you can use a mini XLR connector with an adapter, which is much easier to find online than XLR inserts. Just print a cup to hold it and figure out how you want it to hold underneath. Maybe glue it as is or design something more sophisticated. Uh, the simplest alternative is to use a permanent XLR cable, maybe make two small holes with a small zip tie or design some attachment like most uh, cable connectors use, similar to garden hose and microphone stands. The cap is held by the microphone grills. It's sort of a snap fit connection without snap fits thanks to the flexibility or elasticity of the structure and the plastic. Thanks to the 45 degree slope on the cap, we can carefully pull it out and take out the ribbon motor. The 45 degree angle obviously allows printing the cap without supports. 
Now we can extract the heart and the soul of the microphone, the ribbon motor. As you can see, even the bolts, the nuts, the clamps holding the ribbon are 3D printed. Later we will assemble a new microphone and there I'll use a wire as a twist tie without bothering with nuts and bolts at all. Someday I'll design a snap fit clamp to make it even easier. The pop filters will held in place by their own springiness and there is a very neat trick to print them without modeling at all. We're gonna walk through the printing process, the settings and I'll explain how it's done. Most importantly how many design options this technique opens up with a bit of hot water molding. To thread the XLR connector in and out I'm just using an XLR cable. This prototype is about a year old now, nothing worked, the neodymium magnets were glued with a regular super glue and seemed to hold well, although these specific magnets are thinner than Royer seems to have and are only grade N42 neodymium, the Royer is using grade N52 but KNJ Magnetics didn't have such strong magnets at that time. The thin aluminum ribbon is 2.5 microns thick. Uh, just like a Royer as far as I know. Some forums said that 4 microns are easier to work with but I ordered the 2.5 right away and it went well. A thinner and lighter ribbon together with stronger magnets should have a higher output. Anyway I got myself a cloud lifter which is sort of an amplifier for low output microphones like ribbon and dynamic mics. Apparently dynamic mics are also considered low output microphones. Um, which uses the cloud lifter uses the audio interface 48 volt uh, phantom power uh, to boost the signal and protect the mic from the phantom power at the same time. I guess it all depends on your source volume and your audio interface preamps. Uh, I personally prefer recording at bedroom level. Royer designed their own booster as well as many other companies. I watched this Russian video and Cloudlifter had the least noise to my ears so I went with that. I think it's just a good habit not to connect the ribbon microphones directly into the audio interface in case you forget you turned on the phantom power or turn it by mistake. Here we see a bit of cotton which uh, should have prevented the rattling of the Lundell transformer inside just like in the Royal Factory video but since I used such long wires on everything they pretty much held the transformer in place instead of the cotton. And I just managed to tear the terrible soldering I had here from a year ago. In some vintage video I saw that these parts of the pins are called soldering cups which should uh, make the soldering easier than whatever I tried to do here. I'm too young for uh, soldering, okay? It's a dead thing. To corrugate the ribbon I wanted to 3D print the device as well. The only issue was how to get two gears consistently applying the tiniest adjustable uh, amount of force against each other, uh, like springs. Uh, oh, hi Clippy! So Clippy donated his body to this project. Instead of a $2,000 uh, Royer direct corrugation device, we have a $2 a corrugation device, maybe less. By now you probably noticed that it's pretty easy and straightforward assembly process. Wait for the super glue to dry overnight and just be careful uh, while working with the ribbon. It is up to you whether you want to buy the transformer or make one. It is the most expensive part if you buy one, up to around a hundred dollars. For that reason alone it makes sense just to buy a budget pre-made ribbon microphone. Since I went so far I wanted to find out whether it's possible to make one myself and made two simple toroidal transformers. The first one I made using a tiny ferrite ring I had for years, uh, similar to this bigger one. I never really knew what they were until I did the research on transformers. And the second one I made of an amorphous uh, metal core. To make the testing easier, at first I made this blank microphone and got these DuPont connectors uh, so I can switch the transformers without soldering but I'll use uh, the new microphone parts to do the testing because this setup turned out to be much easier to use. So this is how the pre-made Lundahl transformer sounds like with this particular ribbon thickness, width, length, tension and magnets. Very rich bottom, supposedly the ribbon can be further tuned uh, by blowing on it and I think it gets less boomy the looser it gets but I'm not sure about it, maybe it's the other way around. Different sources said different things and I'm not going to test it today.
maybe a thicker aluminum foil or wider ribbon affect the frequency response as well, I haven't tried anything yet. I have to say that from all comparisons and sound tests I saw of the real Royer R121, I think what makes the real Royer R121 so unique is that it sounds the closest to a condenser microphone uh, while taming those high-end frequencies, making them warmer, um, but without increasing the boominess in the low end to do so. Another thing that I noticed about the Lundahl transformer is that it didn't seem to require any shielding of the transformer or the microphone. While the DIY transformer, transformers will uh, try next, in a moment, uh, did uh, pick up a bit of interference in some situations, but there are several solutions to that. Test, 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 one, two, one, two, test. So this is how the ferrite core transformer sounds like. First of all, it works, but it seems to have less body and you can hear it's picking up a, a bit of interference. You can hear it clear, clearly if I touch the transformer. It is actually the first time I'm getting such an obvious interference, probably because it's the first time I'm using uh, those microphones with a, with a cloud lifter, so I simply didn't hear them before that. It also seems to decrease a bit if I touch the audio interface. Or the connector. So the simplest solution I found to this is wrapping the transformer with kitchen aluminum foil, soldering the ground XLR pin wire to a piece of copper and taping it over. Of course you can use any conductive material like a white copper uh, tape, um, pretty much uh, anything goes. We should also remember that it is not a high output transformer because it's much harder to add more wraps manually using a thinner copper to keep the 1 to 36 uh, ratio between the primary and secondary windings uh, like the pre-made Lundahl transformer has. This is essentially how the voltage generated by the moving ribbon is increased. During that same university course I had a few projects using an Arduino as a DSP device, so I think an audio interface is basically a fancy voltmeter for sampling voltages, just like the Arduino input pins. Anyway, it should be enough for loud sound sources like guitar amps, violins, trumpets and most of what ribbon mics are usually used for, especially if you use it with a booster. On some forum, a guy said that ferrite is not great for low frequencies, so uh, I went and ordered an amorphous core toroid rings, um, which apparently are the ones Mesanovic use, although some YouTube videos do show a ferrite transformer sounding great, so my ferrite core here, the tiny one, oops. So the ferrite ring I used here might be just too small to provide enough uh, magnetic flux or something. Um, or it's not of the required quality or metal types, it's a uh, sort of uh, powder, dense, dense powder. Now we're hearing the amorphous core transformer, it also picks up a bit of interference, but once we shield it and ground it... It sounds great, pretty much like the Lundahl transformer from what I can tell right now and from my tests uh, before.
it still picks up just a tiny tiny bit of interference at least at least in this case when i just <laughs> wrapped it and uh, you know hardwired it and um, but uh, anyway i'm never gonna use it uh, you know for vocals it's gonna record an amp so the amplification on the interface is not going to be anywhere close to this level and um, so it should work uh, pretty much the same as the Lundahl transformer. So I have to give it to the Lundahl for making such a great transformer that uh, doesn't require any work from me. But if I make more of these microphones in the future, I'll go with the DIY Amorphous uh, core transformer. It's easy to make, relatively cheap and sounds great. It's pretty much exactly what I dreamed this mic uh, to be. You know, simple, cheap and effective. A bit of interference, you know, in metal or rock. <laughs> you're probably not gonna hear it uh, probably never for a clean guitar but still if you crank the amp like they all tell you to do I mean uh, if you're making one microphone you can uh, order the Lundahl but if you make several microphones absolutely go with the DIY solution. And amorphous metals apparently have some weird properties. They are like super bouncy. One, two, Wow, that one bounces a lot. <laughs> so it all depends on your preference and how DIY you want to go. These transformers take about uh, two hours to wrap manually or less once you get the hang of it. Instead of counting the wraps like a machine, we roughly measure the length of a single copper wire wrap. Then we decide on the number of secondary wraps and the desired ratio. I tried to replicate the transformer in the Mesonovic video, where they seemingly use a folded wire as a secondary wrap six times, so we multiply six wraps by 36 and the length of a single wrap. The result is the approximate length of a primary wrap wire. Make sure to add another 10 centimeters to each end so that you have something to solder the motor and the XLR connector to later. To wrap the wire, we can improvise a 3D printed uh, manual bobbin runner. You can melt a small hole in the 3D printed bobbin to hold the tip of the wire. Nice alternatives uh, that I found were taping toothpicks uh, or using another paper clip. The longer the device, uh, the thinner the whole bobbin will be once you wrap the wire around, so it will fit a smaller hole as the transformer gets thicker. I'm sure it's pretty possible to 3D print a DIY toroid winder as well, but that's a topic for another video. Uh, since these cores are so tiny, uh, it probably should be based on a rubber silicone belt and not a mechanical uh, runner. Uh, like the ones used for uh, larger toroids. So we move the wire tightly to the bobbin, the runner, and wrap the toroid core uh, while watching Netflix or something. Make sure you don't twist the wire too much while threading the bobbin uh, through the hole because it might snap once too much tension is built. It happened to me on both these first two transformers, so just sand the wire tips, solder the ends carefully and uh, keep going. Since you're using a magnet wire, the wire is coated, so these uh, tiny blobs are not a problem. These transformers work and will save you the most money. For the price of one pre-made transformer, you can make like 10 DIY transformers if you need so many microphones. By the way, when I came to test the different transformers on the Plank mic, except the transformer rattling, I didn't get any signal at first. I had to locate where the circuit breaks, but couldn't find the voltmeter. I had a stupid idea to test the circuit with a battery and the LED light. So this is how the ribbon reacts to a small current passing through it. If you can light a fire with the gum wrap and the battery, Imagine what 48 volts would do to a ribbon microphone if you turn on the audio interface phantom power. Essentially the only problem I ignored until making this video was the shielding of the microphone, because some environments and gear can cause more interference and noise than others. You just saw how it happened to me for the first time and it took me a few hours to figure out how to solve it. In my understanding, all microphone bodies are supposed to act as Faraday cage to protect the internals from external interference. The microphone enclosure supposedly uh, captures those electromagnetic fields and by grounding the enclosure, we get rid of them. 
I guess it's kind of like MRI machines that are placed in EMI shielded rooms or microwaves. I actually have a video on my channel with that exact problem which I had with my first SM57. I was getting a weird noise which I thought was the problem in the interface, so I sent the interface to Focusrite, they checked it, it was all fine. Then I went to the store when I bought the SM57, they sent me to the technician which uh, all he did was uh, solder or connect the ground wire properly to the mic body and the problem disappeared. So it's something I probably could do myself, but I didn't know, uh, you know, nothing about this kind of topic. So, uh, you know, I was also afraid to disassemble the microphone anyway, so I was young and uh, afraid. As a test, you can try wrapping the whole uh, microphone in an aluminum kitchen foil while making contact with the XLR connector. If you don't hear any interference beforehand and didn't notice any change, you probably don't need to bother with any shielding. In case you do notice some extraordinary interference, try shielding and grounding the transformer first. As you have seen and heard, it pretty much should do the work. In a few DIY videos I saw people running two wires around the motor and it supposedly creates a humbucking effect like a guitar pickup, maybe it will help as well. Some other ideas I previously had, like uh, making some sort of an aluminum foil template to glue inside the microphone and obviously use a metal mesh. Uh, I assume one can weave a mesh with a thin copper wire, maybe 3D print some device for it as well. Uh, you can use any wire, any color if you want, just make sure the f to file the mesh edges in case you used some uh, coated wire so that it makes contact with the aluminum foil. A faster alternative would be using an aluminum tape uh, with a conductive adhesive, it should be slightly cheaper than a typical copper tape. Maybe printing with a conductive filament, although modified PLAs are often uh, harder to work with than regular PLA. I tried printing with silk PLA a few times, but at any temperature I got very poor layer adhesion, especially in the small areas and layer changes. You can try spraying or uh, painting the tube inside with a conductive paint, similar to how electric guitar electronics are shielded with carbon tape. There was a paint I used for that same university course project, but after a while it gets dry and peels off very easily, so experiment with different brands or types of paint. A bit harder alternative would be to make a metal mesh pocket uh, inside the tube throughout uh, its whole length. Uh, all it has to do is to make a Faraday cage around the electronics and touch the XLR connector. Anyway, if you don't run into this problem, uh, good for you, uh, but it is something to be aware of when the project involves electronics and audio equipment. Printing the microphone body was a nightmare at first, uh, until I figured I should print it on a raft upside down, since it's so tall and narrow. Uh, this way the grills have less chances to get knocked over. The microphone body tube was printed at a default uh, medium 0.16 mm layer height, upside down on the raft as I said, and the Z seam or Z, or Z seam uh, on the side of the mic. Otherwise you might get nasty blobs on the grills. The rest of the parts were printed uh, at the finest default layer height of 0.12, although eventually I did print the pop filters with the 0.16 millimeters uh, height in three layers. So the color of these thicker pop filters is a bit brighter than the thin ones, and to bend them I used the hot water technique. I'm still using my trusty old Kura 4.3 slicer because when I tried updating it, suddenly my prints started failing, not even related to this project. So unless you have a good reason to update, keep using whatever works. To print the pop filters mesh, there's a fun technique uh, where you just slice a thin solid block STL, but set the top and bottom walls uh, layer count value to zero. Then you choose any fill pattern and density you like, basically the slicer creates the code to print infill in straight lines and borders. When we design a mesh manually, the slicer attempts to print every cell wall instead of efficiently printing in straight lines. An important note when printing a mesh, make sure the bed is very close to the nozzle so that every mesh wire immediately sticks to the build plate, otherwise it will easily mess up. The exciting thing about this technique is that you can use heat molding with hot water to create complex mesh uh, structures and even experiment with molding microphone body shapes. This technique opens a lot of possibilities. Imagine replicating some vintage style microphone by printing flat grills, uh, making some sort of clay or wood template to bend around and you're done. Easy design, easy print, structurally, structurally, 
structurally robust and no overhangs to deal with. In fact, we could do the same on in this project. You would simply print a flat template, bend it around any cylindrical object and you get a single elegant seam on a side. It will probably be... It will... <laughs> It will probably be much more robust since you don't have vertical la layers. As an example, we can print a logo and uh, bend it uh, a bit for gluing onto the mic body or just slap it on with a double sided tape. The ribbon motor assembly is a bit tricky and scary when it comes to stretching the ribbon, but it's pretty easy after you practice a bit with a regular uh, kitchen aluminum foil. Now that we have all the parts we can assemble the microphone, the order of the assembly may depend on whether you want to solder everything or use some sort of connectors, although you can assemble as if you have connectors, just solder the connections later. And just make sure the XLR connector has long enough wires to solder to after you thread the XLR connector. Anyway, we start with the motor magnets to let the super glue cure overnight, just in case. Put a pair of gloves and scratch the magnets with sandpaper where the magnet will contact the motor frame. Use a wet paper tissue to clean the magnetic dust. Get a few different coins to keep the magnets separated and as close to the motor gap walls. Try to stack them in such a way uh, that you need to apply some pressure on the magnets to shove them into the motor on a flat surface. Once you feel comfortable with the process, apply a thin layer of super glue on the motor gap walls and the magnets. Push the magnets into the gap and quickly wipe the excess glue. Let them set overnight. Meanwhile, you can prepare the clamp bolts and nuts. Since they are so small, 3D printed and have to fit perfectly, they are a bit tight at first, so you'll have to thread them a few times back and forth so they smooth uh, each other out. I suggest using two sets of pliers for this. One holds the bolt, the second threads the nut. You just need to be able to finger tighten the tip of the bolt uh, once we clamp the ribbon. Measure two pieces of copper tape for the ribbon to lie on and solder a connection wire to each. You can obviously use a piece of tin can and just super glue it on the motor. But please don't solder on the motor. The iron will simply melt those beams so uh, the motor will warp and collapse on itself because of, of uh, the magnets. Stick the copper tapes without touching the magnets. Make sure the copper tapes are long enough so you can wrap it around for additional strength or a cut if necessary. It is better to solder the top wire behind the motor rather than on the top so that the mic cap can fit on the top. To cut the ribbon measure the effective gap between the magnets and cut an aluminum strip about 1 to 2 millimeters narrower. The royal ribbon is cut on a dense 1 mm grid cutting mat, uh, while you can mark the width on a piece of paper first and then align uh, with the aluminum sheet edge. Before doing it for the first time, I suggest uh, you try cutting and corrugating a, a stripe of paper or kitchen foil first to see if the ribbon width is right and feel how aluminum behaves during corrugation and tensioning. Aluminum isn't as elastic as you might think. It is very easy to straighten the corrugation. Corrugate the ribbon with our super expensive device. Use tweezers or a wet ear swab to grab the ribbon and roughly position the ribbon on the motor. Put a drop of water on one of the copper pieces and use a dry swab to slide it gently around for the perfect position. Put the clamp with screws over it and finger tighten the screws. Now do the same for the other side but tension the ribbon before sticking it on the wet copper piece. You can stretch it even more by sliding the ribbon with a dry swab. Once the position looks right, and the ribbon doesn't touch the magnets, put the second clamp and tighten it. Now you can further tighten the nuts with pliers. Don't be afraid if the clamp falls in the process because the water should still grab the ribbon uh, long enough for you to uh, you know, put the clamp on and tighten it. The fact that you can slide the ribbon on a drop of water with a dry swab makes the process super simple. Alternatively, you can skip the whole nuts and bolts part uh, by using twist ties, a uh, regular wire or small zip ties. It really doesn't take much force to hold the poor little ribbon in place. Even a drop of water holds it in place, as you just saw. Since this particular motor gap is much wider, the bolts are sticking out too much, so uh, the motor doesn't fit and I used the same transformer wire as a twist tie. In the future, I will probably design some flat profile snap fit clamp to make it even easier to assemble. Now we just need to connect the wires together. Thread the XLR connector into the tube,
connect or solder the XLR and motor wires to the transformer. If needed, wrap the transformer with a bit of cotton or anything soft to prevent it rattling inside the tube and put the motor in place. As I was making this video, I found that making a small bend in the connector wires uh, helps sliding the motor in place by bending, essentially folding the wire in the tube using uh, the transformer uh, bobbin. So you don't need to force or shove messy wiring uh, everything is neat and tidy. Also until making this video I used to slide the pop filters after the motor and closing it with the cap uh, but the pop filters sometimes get stuck on the slots if the mesh is too thick or wide making it hard to assemble and even opening up the grills. So the funny solution would be to put a band on the top but the most convenient is just to print narrow, narrower 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 uh, pop filters, pre-bend them and glue them in place with a few drops of super glue on the edges. And that's it, you have a ribbon microphone and another ribbon microphone. If you wish to experiment with ribbon tension, just blow on it gently through the pop filters and see if the frequency response changes. The pop filter uh, makes the airflow more stable and even, so that you don't uh, tear, tear the ribbon. You also have access and knowledge uh, using an oscilloscope, uh, might be able to adjust the tension of the ribbon to a desired frequency response like Royer Labs do. Uh, this probably provide consistency in frequency response if you make several microphones. For those who want to go even more DIY, there is a guy who made a ribbon by dissolving and separating aluminum foil from a bubblegum wrap. Some say the same can be done with a cigarette aluminum foil. If you extra bored, you can take kitchen foil and try yourself at gold beating. In this case, aluminum beating, it's crazy enough to actually work. If anyone figures out what type of pins, um, solder cups, the, the XLR connector standard requires, uh, the naming of it, how to find it, we could easily design a tiny cup, a connector to glue or thread into the bottom of the tube or just to hold the pre-made XLR insert. If you find more strange ideas, feel free to share them in the comments. I'm sure many of you can come up with brilliant suggestions, so we all can take notes and make even cooler things next time. Maybe a transformer from an old phone charger can work. I hope this inspires you to push your skills a bit further or acquire new ones to create something useful. Maybe for yourself, maybe as a present to your fellow musician friends, maybe sell it, maybe use it as a display unit or proof of concept. Even without a 3D printer, you can grab a piece of wood in the forest, get a Dremel and make that plank mic. That was my initial goal, long before I had a 3D printer. We all have enough junk to make amazing and useful things, even if it's only for the sake of making mildly entertaining YouTube videos. The important thing is to enjoy the process, because that's how you get things done eventually, even if it takes you years to finish. Uh, so good luck, have fun, document your projects, and it might be worth it. Gena. Тебе очень тяжело нести вещи. Ну как тебе сказать, чебурашка? Очень тяжело. <laughs>